Hello, I'm Gary Millette, and this is topic number three of the wireless networking technologies short course. And uh, this is the introduction to wireless networking technology part two, the second uh, part of two parts that were broken up because of their length. So let's get to it. <clears throat> so we've talked about cellular. At this point, let's turn our attention to what I referred to as the IEEE wireless technologies. The three main topics to discuss are IEEE 802.11, wireless LANs, IEEE 802.15, wireless PANs, and uh, turns out the IEEE no longer maintains this standard. We'll talk about a little bit more about what happened there. And IEEE 802.16, wireless MANs. So we'll start with the most well-known wireless LANs or 802.11. Again, some of this technology's history has already been touched on. Fast tracking to the present, 802.11 is a mature technology driven by consumer demand. It uses unlicensed spectrum, the 2.4 and 5.7 gigahertz bands to operate, and today uses both OFDM and MIMO technology to achieve high-speed data transfers. Um, 802.11n has a maximum data rate of 600 megabits per second. Fairly recent extensions of 802.11, specifically 802.11ac and 802.11ad, have raised the maximum Wi-Fi data rates to over 1 gigabit per second in higher bands and introduced use of frequencies in the 60 gigahertz band. That's uh, 802.11ad. Now, to be most efficient, we will focus on the differences between cellular technology and the IEEE technology. Since the purpose of 802.11 is to extend the wired LAN wirelessly, it is necessary to be able to connect to the wired wireless LAN. This process is facilitated by what are known as wireless LAN services. Most of these services operate in the background, and more so after once being set up for the first time, or you interface with them through the end device's operating system. Today, an interesting crossover between cell phones and other wireless mobile devices like iPads exist with Wi-Fi networks. One cell phone or iPad or other similar end devices can connect to either a wireless service provider or a local Wi-Fi network. The difference is, what, the cost. One must pay for cell service, while typically Wi-Fi is free. Of course, try telling that the high-class hotels that still charge for Wi-Fi. For a connection to a Wi-Fi network, a MAC address associated with the device's internal network adapter is used. Usually, the device's operating system, or OS, will provide the user with a list of locally available wireless network connections through a taskbar icon. The user then picks the one to connect to. Once authenticated by the network, that is, you've got to give your security key and so forth, a username, the connection is completed. Contrast this to a cell phone in a car. When turned on, you're automatically connected to the cellular network with all the needed operations performed by the system in the background. Things like authentication, accounting, billing, and so forth. Both systems use similar radio technology to establish connections to their respective networks. Let's look at 802.11 first. When first turned on, an end device, known as a station in the 802.11 standard, will enter either a passive or active scanning mode under software control. In the passive mode, it will listen for the transmission of a beacon frame having the service set identifier, we call that SSID, that the station wants to join. Once the station has detected the beacon, a connection will be negotiated by proceeding with the standard authentication and association process. In active scanning mode, a probe frame is transmitted by the station. This frame indicates a particular SSID of the network the station wants to join. If a probe response frame is received by the station from the desired network, the wireless connection is made in a normal fashion. If not, the user needs to make a choice of which network to join, if one exists. If a probe is sent with a default broadcast SSID, any network within range will respond. So hopefully these details will help to explain the operation of one's laptop or other end device at different locations. Certainly, if one is at home, the end device will attach to the wireless network that you have previously indicated that you want it to automatically attach to. The same scenario happens at your workplace. Now the operation mirrors cell phone operation. 
However, <clears throat> at some new location, the end devices software will take you through a series of steps to finally connect to a wireless access point, at which time you must go through the authentication process. After a station has joined the wireless 802.11 network, it becomes synchronized to a common master clock that's offered by the access point and implements the physical layer setup parameters offered by the network. Now the cell phone, or today's smartphone, will search for Wi-Fi access first, if so configured. Of course, if there is no Wi-Fi networks available or accessible, the end device, if so capable, will now try to attach to a cellular network. The cell phone scenario just mentioned a few slides ago, you know, what happens in a moving vehicle. It does that now. The cellular smartphone scans for signals from available cellular networks, preferably from one's wireless service provider. Once a cellular network system is detected, the phone will attempt to register itself in the network. There are various network management entities like the Home Location Register, or HLR, the Visitor Location Register, or VLR, and triple A AA register, which stands for authentication, authorization, and accounting. Uh, they will allow the smartphone to use the network's resources if you are a customer. Assorted control channel signals are used to facilitate these operations. So in summary, today there are many other extensions to the 802.11 standard being developed. Uh, for instance, 802.11p was adopted in 2010 to add the vehicular environment and 802.11y adds high power operation in the 3550 to 3600 megahertz band. Uh, remember that uh, uh, the FCC is working on freeing that up and uh, adding it to our Wi-Fi frequencies. Again, 802.11ad has added future greater than one gigabit per second operation in the millimeter wave bands, known as Y gig, and 802.11af will allow the use of white space TV frequencies. That is TV frequencies where there's no channel assigned locally. Uh, IEEE 802.11.xx technology has morphed and adapted effectively to meet customer demand. So here's a summary with a nice graphic. Uh, the diagram shows a family of 802.11.xx standards that range for home use and the frequencies used for the particular extension. Uh, recall that RF propagation is a function of frequency among other things. The IEEE 802.11.xx standard has adapted to new uses and applications by introducing new physical layers as time has gone on. So you can see here, we have 802.11 in, in the inside the house, 802.11 AD, and it shows a tablet working at 60 gigahertz with a TV. Uh, the next one is 802.11 A slash AC with the orange uh, dotted area. So it works at 5 gigahertz and has a slightly bigger range. There's a, and then there's 802.11 B, G, and N. That's the green dotted area at 2.4 gigahertz. And notice it actually extends a little bit outside the house. Uh, then we have 802.11 AH. Notice that is at 900 megahertz. That's a lower frequency, has better propagation characteristics, and that covers the entire house. And then finally, 802.11 AF, which is at 54 to 700 megahertz, and notice that he has even a wider range still. So as time has gone on, the standards have evolved to have, give you better range. So taking a cue from the cellular world, the Wi-Fi industry has recently started to refer to Wi-Fi generations, although we previously did not have Wi-Fi generations. So what happens here in this see in this table, table one, comparing Wi-Fi 5 and Wi-Fi 6 standards, um, the first column shows the parameters, the second column shows how they are um, compared to from Wi-Fi 5 to Wi-Fi 6 in the second, third column rather. So in the second column, Wi-Fi 5, which is 802.11ac, uh, the frequency is 5 gigahertz, has various bandwidths that go up to 160 megahertz. The access is OFDM. The antennas are 4x4 uh, MIMO. Uh, there's 256 QAM for modulation. Maximum data rate 3.5 gigabits per second and maximum users per access point of four. <clears throat> you go over to Wi-Fi 6, generation 6, it lists 802.11ax, uses two frequencies, has the same band maximum bandwidth, but now uses OFDMA for access, 8x8 for the antennas for the MIMO, uh, 1024 QAM, 
9.6 gigabits per second and eight possible users. So right now, people are referring to the fact we are at Wi-Fi 6. Now, in this table, spectrum to come for Wi-Fi 6, the 6 gigahertz band. So Wi-Fi 6 is easier than the next or current generation, depending upon one's viewpoint. And your chart shows the expansion into the 6 gigahertz band by Wi-Fi 6. So UNII band 5, 6, 7, and 8 are going to be adopted. Notice the frequency range goes from 59.25 megahertz all the way up to 71.25 megahertz. And there's a very large amount of bandwidth available there. It looks like a grand total of 1,200 megahertz. So it should be pointed out that 802.11ad will also uh, be used in the 57 to 61 gigahertz band. As yet, there's a lack of hardware available for this operation, but it'll be coming soon. In the future, 802.11 technology will most likely be the gateway to, to the internet for wireless sensor networks. The sensor network might use another wireless technology like 802.15 to operate, but eventually connect to the internet through a gateway wireless LAN connection. Eventually, most infrastructure will have some type of Wi-Fi associated with it, just like other utilities that we take for granted, for instance, water, heat, and electricity. So I've shown this one before, and this is how will IoT devices be connected. This is, again, an IoT analytics, and it shows actual values up until the second quarter of 2020, a little bit more than a year ago, and then it has predictions all the way up to 2020. 25. So we've talked about this before. Uh, the very red uh, area is wireless personal area networks or wireless PANs. Uh, the area above that is wireless local area networks or wireless LANs. Uh, and the area above that is cellular 2G, 3G, and 4G. Uh, the very uh, well pinkish type of area, the fourth one up, are LPWAs, which are low power wide area networks. Then you have wired is blue. Other is gray, uh, darker gray is 5G, and another shade of gray, wireless metropolitan area networks. So if you take a look at this, you discover that very few connections are predicted to be of the Ethernet type connection. Uh, most IoT devices are predicted to be connected wirelessly. So 802.15 wireless technology started off as a solution to a growing problem was an attempt at reducing the number of special cables needed in the computing and multimedia arena. Originally, and still known as Bluetooth, this technology introduced a new type of wireless network, the personal area network, or PAN. A personal area network is usually considered to be a network that only extends a small distance, typically about 10 meters, a personal operating space, if you will. So the goal of the standard is to provide wireless connectivity with fixed, portable, and moving devices either within or entering within a personal operating space. There have been several extensions to the 802.11, excuse me, 15 standard that deal with emerging technologies such as wireless sensor networks. These extensions will be the primary topic that will be addressed here. So but what we want to do is compare maybe wireless LANs to wireless PANs. So let's take a look. The wireless LAN or WLAN has been designed to support transportable types of computing while a wireless PAN WPAN has been designed to support more mobile devices. So let's do a comparison of, say, power levels and coverage areas, media control techniques, and network lifespan or duration. So let's take a look at coverage areas first. Wireless LAN support coverage areas that are in the hundreds of meters range, and thus powers of 100 milliwatts are required to support this operating range. Wireless PANs provide limited coverage areas, approximately 10 meters maximum, thus output powers of one milliwatt are typical. Now I've added a note here. Recent changes to the standard have increased 802.15 output power, hence range. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Wireless LAN components like access points, APs, need to be located properly and need 120 volts AC connections. Wireless PANs primarily use battery-operated devices. One cannot buy a battery-operated Wi-Fi access point. That is if we don't consider smartphones. Wireless PANs form ad hoc networks that are controlled by a single member of the PAN network known as a master. Um, other members of the ad hoc network are known as slaves. And as I have a note here, the committee that wrote the original 802.15 standards were not 
sensitive to political correctness at the time they did their work. Uh, I haven't checked, but maybe they have changed the standard since it's been taken back over by the uh, Bluetooth's uh, special interest group. Through a time multiplex time slotted system, <clears throat> the master is able to poll the slaves to determine the bandwidth or quality of service, that's QOS, that they will need for a particular operation. The master device regulates the bandwidth required by slave device based on the quality of service requested. For example, Bluetooth hands-free operation for cell phones might be what the service is that's requested. Through the use of multiple short time slots, high quality traffic may be supported. The system operates by devices ultimately transmitting and then receiving. This is known as simplex operation. A wireless PAN device must be able to take the role of either a master or slave within a newly formed network. Now the lifespan of a wireless PAN is much different than that of a wireless LAN. Once the wireless LAN is deployed, it is placed into existence whether or not there are any mobile stations attached to it. For a wireless PAN, the existence of a network can be fleeting or longer lasting, but is usually of limited time. For a wireless PAN, its existence is limited to the time necessary to perform a data transfer. Furthermore, the members of an ad hoc network can change rapidly. Bluetooth enabled devices may enter into two basic types of ad hoc networks, either PicoNets or ScatterNets. Now a PicoNet is formed by a Bluetooth device serving, up, serving as a master and at least one or more up to a maximum of seven Bluetooth devices acting as slaves. The PicoNet is defined by the frequency hopping scheme of the master. This parameter is a key part of the operation of the radio transmitter receiver system. All Bluetooth devices taking part in the PicoNet are synchronized to the clock of the master of the PicoNet and hence to the same hopping sequence. PicoNet slaves only communicate with master device with the master device in a point-to-point -point fashion and under the direct control of the master. Furthermore, the PicoNet master may communicate in either a point-to-point -point or point-to-multipoint -point fashion. The standard does not define permanent masters or slaves. Now, we're going to take a look at the IEEE 802.15.4 standard. So the 802.15.4 standard supports a low data rate or what's called LR WPAN mode of operation. A basic characteristic, characteristic of the WPAN's operation is data transfer rates at speeds less than or equal to 250 kilobits per second. Ultra low power consumption for long battery life, small form factor, and low cost and complexity. Now the target space for 802.15.4 is the many proposed applications for wireless sensor networks. Um, and again, wireless sensor networks really came before the Internet of Things. This technology seems extremely suitable for various IoT applications. There's something called the Zigbee Alliance. There's a link to it. There's a good source of information about the Zigbee application space. So Zigbee application target areas are commercial building management, consumer electronics, that would be high definition TV and 3D, energy management, say smart grid, healthcare and fitness, residential management, retail management, telecommunications. Uh, I should point out the Zigbee Alliance has changed somewhat and has moved over into the IoT arena. So in addition to all the services and devices found in Zigbee Smart Energy version 1, version 2 will provide more features. They will include control of plug-in electric vehicles, uh, the charging of those vehicles, installation, configuration, and firmware download for hand devices, uh, prepay services, user information and messaging, load control, demand response, and common information and application profile interfaces for wired and wireless home area networks or HANs. Now, turns out the 802.15.4 bands are not universal. Uh, 868 MHz is used in Europe, 950 MHz in the Americas, and 2.4 GHz is basically worldwide. Also, IEEE 802.15.4 PicoNets provide for a star or peer-to-peer -peer structure. Home applications would typically employ the star structure, while industrial and commercial applications have driven the strategy of the peer-to-peer -peer network structure. Now we're going to take a look at some other technologies here. Uh, 802.15.4a came about in 2007. Uh, this amendment will define an alternative physical layer for data communication standard 
with precision ranging within one meter, extended range, enhanced robustness, and mobility to 802.15.4. So these GPS enhanced systems open up the application space and increase functionality of sensor systems. There's 802.15.4D. <clears throat> this amendment is used to support operation in a 950 megahertz band that was recently authorized in Japan. There's 802.15.4C. This amendment supports use of sub 1 gigahertz bands in China. That's 314 to 316 megahertz, 430 to 434 megahertz, and 779 to 787 megahertz. There's also IEEE 802.15.4E. This amendment facilitates industrial applications such as those addressed by what's known as HART 7 and ISA 5100, rather. Those are hardened wireless networks for harsh industrial environments where noise is a large concern. Uh, the next one here is 802.15.4F. That's a ultra low energy consumption active RFID devices and sensors. Uh, we have 802.15.4G, smart grid applications in the 700 megahertz to 1 gigahertz and 2.4 gigahertz bands. This would be very large scale process control applications. 802.15.4J, this supports medical body area networks, uh, services operating in the 2360 megahertz to 24 megahertz band. It's to use to develop the, to facilitate the development of e-health applications. Uh, more about this in another module. Uh, we have 802.15.5. This amendment facilitates mesh operation for 802.15 technologies uh, used to facilitate non-line of sight operation. Keep going with this, 802.15.6. The purpose of this most recent amendment is to develop an international standard for a short range wireless communication standard in the vicinity of or inside the human body and not limited to humans, so maybe your pet. Low power and highly reliable with data rates to 10 megabits per second for evolutionary entertainment and e-healthcare services. Um, the next standard brings lightweight communications into this arena. So this is a long one here, 802.15.7, project scope. This standard defines a physical and MAC layer for short range optical wireless communications using visible light in optically transparent media. So that's using visible light in free space, you know, that is, just the air. Uh, so the visible light spectrum extends from 380 to 780 nanometers in wavelength. The standard is capable of delivering data rates sufficient to support audio and video multimedia services and also considers mobility of the visible link. Compatibility with, vis with visible light infrastructures, impairments due to noise and interference from sources like ambient light, and a MAC layer that accommodates visible links. The standard will adhere to any applicable I safety regulations. So that's quite a bit of things going on with 802.15. So let's go back to Bluetooth. Uh, this is titled Extension to Bluetooth. So recently, we mentioned this before, the Bluetooth Special Interest Group has taken over control of the standard. IEEE 802.15.1 is no longer maintained by the IEEE. And they've added many extensions that facilitate IoT operation. Uh, there's a link to the Bluetooth uh, website uh, shown there. Higher data rates, different power classes with different coverage differences, distances rather up to 100 meters for industrial Bluetooth are available. The most recent extensions were ratified in January 2019. That was called version 5.1. Direction, location, finding, positioning. Uh, a Samsung smartphone app that can locate other Bluetooth devices or objects. And it turns out that uh, you might lose your earbuds. So you'd use the app to find them. In January 2020, version 5.2, known as LE Audio. This enhancement will run the Bluetooth Low Energy, that's the LE, uh, radio lowering battery consumption and allow the protocol to carry sound and add features such as one set of headphones connecting to multiple audio sources or multiple headphones connecting to one source. It uses a new LC3 codec. Uh, the LE Audio will also add support for hearing aids. So, Original Bluetooth is known now as BR1M, or basic rate. Uh, some of the other extensions are EDR3M and 2M. Uh, that stands for enhanced data rates. Uh, LE2M and 1M is low energy. And LE500K and LE125K, uh, where in all cases the number indicates the data rate in bits. 
Now, there's other short-range wireless technologies that exist also. There's something called 6 low pan. That's IP version 6 and low-power wireless personal area networks. Uh, brings IP version 6 and 802.15.4 together and is an enabler of the Internet of Things concept. There's something called Z-Wave. It's a proprietary wireless standard for home automation. Uh, there's a Z-Wave Alliance. There's a link to that shown there. And newest is the uh, MIOTI supported by Texas Instrument. That's M-I-O-T-Y. So a summary of 802.15.4, as the number of IoT applications grows, there will be more applications that utilize wireless and wired sensor networks to perform their function. To enable the wireless sensor network, some wireless network will obviously be necessary. So depending upon the location and or application, either the cellular system or an IEEE wireless technology will be used to provide connectivity. Most likely either 802.11 and or 802.15.4. By the way, a new contender in this arena is LoRa Wireless. We'll talk about that later. Now we shift gears to 802.16. Uh, it has been employed for a long time around the world in its pre-standard form and now is an accepted standard. Most of its applications were in areas of the world that did not enjoy much in the way of telecom infrastructure and for that reason, it really did not have much of a market in the U.S. When the standard was finally adopted, it was thought until just recently that it could be a big competitor in the 4G and beyond market. IEEE 802.16 originally used microwave frequencies, 10 to 66 gigahertz, exclusively for transmission over line of sight pass. Today's new amended 802.16 standard also allows for use of non-LOS operation in the 2 to 11 gigahertz frequency range including the unlicensed bands, and it adds new digital modulation transmission technologies into the mix. IEEE 802.16 was originally designed for the Wireless Metropolitan Area Network, or MAN space. Wireless MANs provide basic network access to buildings or other infrastructure, exterior antennas and a subscriber station, known as an SS, are used to implement the radio link between a central base station and the building. This is a case of point to multipoint operation. The wireless MAN offers an alternative to wireline type access networks. Once inside the building, wired Ethernet or wireless, in other words, Wi Fi, is used for distribution. A wireless MAN effectively serves as a bridge to an existing network infrastructure. Wireless MANs differ from wireless LANs and wireless PANs by the scale of their operation. Wireless PANs have a range of meters. Wireless LANs have a range of several hundreds of meters, and wireless MANs have a range of several kilometers or more, depending upon their setup and purpose, which at this point appears to be less as an access technology and more as a point-to-point -point technology. As I mentioned earlier, 802.16 or WiMAX is an access technology has recently lost favor in the cellular arena. However, many smart grid implementation plans have included WiMAX in their network infrastructure plans, particularly as a backhaul technology from neighborhood area networks, or NANs. Uh, these NANs gather smart meter data for relay back to a central control point. Whether this comes to fruition or not is anybody's guess at this time. So as with other wireless technologies, subscriber stations, or SSs, have a MAC address that is used to uniquely identify them to the network. IEEE 802.16 technology is complicated, but to be sure, it uses OFDM and OFDMA technology, as well as many other forms of technology already presented in this module. Again, for more detailed information about this technology and its operation, you might want to see my book um, called Wireless Telecommunication Systems and Networks. What about LoRa? This open standard known as LoRa for long range has recently started to garner a great deal of interest for use in IoT applications that are geographically larger that could be handled by IEEE wireless technologies and Bluetooth. LoRa is a physical layer technology that uses a spread spectrum modulation technique derived from chirp spread spectrum or CSS technology. The LoRa WAN specification is a low power wide area um, or LPWA networking protocol designed to wirelessly connect battery operative things to the internet. The LoRa WAN protocol facilitates the connection of things in regional national or global networks, and targets key IoT requirements such as bi-directional communication, 
end-to-end -end security, mobility, and localization services. LoRaWAN network architecture is deployed in a star of stars topology in which gateways relay messages between end devices and a central network server. The gateways are connected to the network server via standard IP connections and act as a transparent bridge, simply converting RF packets to IP packets and vice versa. The wireless communication takes advantage of the long range characteristics of the LoRa physical layer, allowing a single hop link between the end device and one of many gateways. All modes are capable of the bi-directional communication and there is support for multicast addressing groups to make efficient use of spectrum during tasks such as firmware over the air, or what's called FOTA, uh, upgrades or other mass distribution messages. There's a link that is about LoRa shown on the slide. The specification defines the device to infrastructure or LoRa physical layer parameters and LoRa WAN protocol, and so provides seamless interoperability between manufacturers as demonstrated by the device certification program. While the specification defines the technical implementation, it does not define any commercial model or type of deployment, whether that be public, shared, private, or enterprise, and so offers the industry the freedom to innovate and differentiate how it is used. The LoRa WAN specification is developed and maintained by the LoRa Alliance, and again, there's a link to their webpage. So this slide shows the LoRa WAN protocol, and it's a uh, Diagram shows a typical implementation, uh, the LoRa devices, end nodes, wirelessly, commu wirelessly communicate with the LoRa gateways, which are connected to a network server. The network server passes a TCP IP secure payload to the application servers. So if you look at this diagram, on the far left are end nodes, and you have things like pet tracking, smoke alarm, water meter, trash container, vending machine, gas monitoring. And all those things are connected to a concentrator or a gateway. Uh, those things are backhauled, uh, looks like 3G or Ethernet. Uh, and of course, that would be an opportunity for uh, WiMAX uh, 802.16. Uh, there's a network server, and it turns out the network server uh, passes the information out to the application servers. Uh, and it turns out, if you take a look, uh, it's advanced encryption um, secured payload, payload rather from end nodes to application server. So comparison of wireless technology, I'm not gonna to go too much detail here. Uh, chart shows how LoRa WAN compares with other cellular wireless data technologies. Uh, several characteristics stick out. The link budget is better than the others. Battery life is longest. Power efficiency and interference immunity is very high, among many other good features. And again, there's a link to the LoRa Alliance there that talks about this also. Another comparison of wireless technologies, this older chart shows how LoRa WAN compares with some other wireless data technologies. And I'm not going to belabor that chart. So there's something called Myote. The newest player in this arena is known as Myote or <laughs> Myote again. Uh, you might want to go the Imodi, if I can get it out, the Myote Alliance. So there's a link to that. Uh, what is it? It's a low power wide area network, an LP WAN protocol that is purpose built for massive industrial and commercial IoT deployments. Uh, Fran Hoffer's patented telegram splitting, the core of the MyOT protocol is designed to conquer the scalability, interference, and mobility issues of legacy wireless IoT technologies. Uh, this new communication approach divides a message into multiple sub-packets and transmits them at different times and frequencies. Dramatically reduced on-air time combined with pseudo-randomness and superior channel coding provide unrivaled robustness against external interference while maximizing overall system capacity. Time will tell this new protocol will become popular. I believe Texas Instrument is big on it. So let's summarize. The newest and most widely spread, or rather the newest and most widespread life altering applications of the IoT, such as smart grid, vehicle to vehicle, and e healthcare depend greatly upon wireless internet connectivity. Alternative energy sources are enabled by the smart grid, V2V 
Traffic safety applications depend upon ad hoc wireless networks and complex sensor and actuators within vehicles. And e-healthcare requires monitoring of humans through wireless networks. We will see more and more of this type of technology, that is CPSs, as we move forward. 